Hi and welcome. Tonight's video is going to be a little bit different. Since I'm doing some remote teaching, I have a class that is doing art history and I thought I would use some art history as an inspiration for tonight's painting. So tonight we're going to look at the Minoans and a little bit about this is going to be just a very brief survey of this amazing and mysterious culture. Um, this Bronze Age culture is officially the first European culture in the recorded history. Um, here is the archaeological dig that Sir Arthur Evans um, both excavated and renovated um, due to being kind of an early uh, predecessor of archaeology. Um, there were no sort of uh, professional practice or, or customs around what an archaeologist did back in the, in the day. What um, Sir Arthur Evans did was taking some inspiration from Heinrich Schliemann, who utilized the text from Homer to find the historic site of Troy, Agamemnon's mask and all of that. Um, Sir Arthur Evans looked into those ancient texts and believed that there were um, there were evidence there was ev evidence in those old texts uh, supporting the story of King Minos and um, Theseus and, and and some of these early tales uh, from Greek mythology that that pointed to something going on on Crete. Um, this is Knossos, the the site that he excavated, and you could see these iconic. Um, you can see these three red columns, these inverted columns where they're wider at the top and tapered thinner toward the bottom. Um, these have been repainted and, and somewhat reconstructed by Sir Arthur Evans and his team um, in the early 1900s. And it's a very cool site because, you know, something like that wouldn't happen today. Um, today we would leave everything as is. And if anything, we would do reconstructions virtually or we would have... Um, you know, pictorial representations that accompany the site. But here, if you visit this site on Crete, you can actually walk through a semi-restored um, ancient ruin of a civilization that goes as far back as European civilizations go. Um, in this case, we're talking about um, settlements that um, on the island, settlements happened as early as six or 7,000 years before the Common Era um, with the formal Minoan timeline starting in what we call the pre-palatial period around 3500 um, and then it gets 3500 before the common era um, where the proto-palatial period is at 1900 and then the neo-palatial where we get into kind of the more high art and, and more flourishing of the society um, between 1750 and, and 1500 and then sort of the decline of the society um, following that uh, kind of 1500 to 1100. Um, all of this is Bronze Age culture um, and so that kind of um, category of technology defining kind of the, the advancements that these people um, had uh, that you could find in, in the archaeological digs. But um, the thing that's most important to me about uh, this presentation is just showing you some of the incredibly beautiful artwork. Here you can see um, this is what what is called the saffron gatherers, and they're they're gathering the central part of the flower on this the the saffron um, these little stems and or stamens in the middle of the flower, and these are uh, highly sought after spice. You know, an incredibly valuable good to be traded, um, but not only is it is it just a beautiful representation of what may have been somewhat of a common act uh, for these people long ago, but just look at the way that the figure is handled. Look at the beautiful color combinations, um, the strong blues and the and the rusty reds in, in in combination. That orange and blue color is very striking. And then if you would also notice the ornamentation in the dress, um, these layered tiered dresses that are um, covered with patterning and um, and then the intricate ornamentation across the blouse and then 
this like almost like is it headgear or or some sort of wrap around the hair and the hair tied up and then large earrings uh, very modern makeup um you know with like painted lips and and strong uh, eye makeup and it just feels like in, in some ways an incredibly modern take on um on a very ancient, I mean, for, for a very, very ancient piece of artwork, it has a really modern feel in some ways, um, at least in, in terms of the aesthetic and the beauty. Um, if we if we kind of look further in, you can see some more of this strong, um, strongly expressive artwork. And you can see the commonality between these two slides shows that in both cases, uh, figures are treated with a lot of grace and fluidity. And, and that similarly, that similar handling of the landscape and then any of the animal um, depictions. Look at the long, sinuous, curvilinear lines that um, compose this, like, kind of the line of action um, in this, what I would call stylized realism. Um, you have this, these figures that are kind of coming out of the, that two dimensional plane. They're not quite like um, something you would find in maybe Egypt. They're, they're more kind of, uh, naturalistic, but there's still a strongly stylized realism about it. Um, there's definitely some observational realism happening here, but it's it's in a very stylized way. And something you can find uh, far beyond this presentation in the artwork is um, what seems to be just like a joyful, um, joyful depiction, kind of this like honoring of, fl of, of a flourishing of nature and human beings within it. Um, I mean, look at this fresco. This is from, uh, I think it's the the Queen's Megaron, which is, is this part of the Knossos uh, palatial complex where there's, um, I think I have an interior shot of it, but there's like kind of like a throne room, um, frescoes all the way around the walls, um, basins for ritual practice, and all of this kind of thing, like all together with these amazing frescoes on the walls intricate detailing around the the post and lintels um kind of uh, wrapping around all the doorways these open cavities above the doorways to allow airflow uh, to to act as sort of a natural um, climate control these doorways would have been able to be closed by some sort of either wood partitions or fabric partitions um they were as you could imagine um this repetition of all these rectangular shapes and these beautiful doorways um, just flooding through this super um, dense uh, system of doorways and that could be moved and opened and closed at will um, to change the shape and and also the airflow in different spaces a very labyrinthine design which is 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 no accident if you look at the uh, mythology that's connected to this place over here you can see uh, what remains of some of the um, the actual plumbing? This these this Bronze Age civilization had working indoor plumbing, flushing toilets, um, unbelievable technology. Um, here, look at this amazing. Uh, this is from it's called like the harvest. Yeah, the, ah, I'm forgetting the name of it, but um, I'll see if I can if I can scroll through on my notes and have it. But um, this was sculpted out of a steatite, and it's sculpted in. If you look at the actual cup, it's like a it's kind of like an egg shaped vessel sculpted to look a bit like an ostrich egg, um, which was a, a luxury item at the time. Um, and so this beautiful relief carved into the whole, like all the way around the entire. Uh, vessel, these men, and whether it's the the spring or fall, but some part of the harvest ritual, and then here we have an important um, either ritual figure, um, priestess, goddess, deity of some kind. We you know we don't know. Um, unfortunately, the the language that these people wrote in, uh, we call Linear A, is still yet to be deciphered. So um, all we can glean from um, from these people is, is from their own artwork and from writings about them from other people from the kind of um, how far away their trade goods reached and, and that was pretty extensive we see we see Minoan pottery and um, other you know um, 
goods that would you know we can't find their textiles or anything that would have degraded over time by now obviously but any of the goods that and that would have happened to be traded uh, pottery for is, is a prime example is found as far away as the Iberian Peninsula obviously Greece uh, what is modern-day Italy um, all the way into uh, Cana um, uh, Anatolia uh, obviously Egypt um, and, and we'll look at a map of kind of this this region in, in a minute but here's some examples of their pottery this is um, this kind of bird like shape and this kind of uh, you know, reaching up kind of, uh, as you'd imagine, like a bird in spring, baby bird reaching up to grab food from its mother, kind of everything about their work has this kind of life affirming uh, feeling. And then here in the middle is a really interesting figure. It's a snake priestess is what they call it. Um, semi reconstructed by Sir Arthur Evans and his team. Um, this figure seems to point to one of the central religious activities or ritual activities that were associated with the Minoans and um, a lot more of that I'll, I'll talk about as we kind of move on. Um, this this little chunk of a fresco is called La Parisienne, or the, the Parisian, uh, forgive me my horrible French, but um, and it's from a site called Akrotiri, which is, is I believe to the north and east of the site on Crete that we were looking at initially. And then here's a, a bit of a fresco. I think this is from the Queen's Megaron. Um, there's just a, a huge density of work to look at. And for this short preview, we're just going to look at a few of these things. And then I'm going to begin to kind of flesh out my thoughts about the Minoans um, and, and kind of where did they come from and what happened to them and the kind of the end of their their um, cultural flourishing in the Bronze Age. So with that, um, let's go ahead and exit here. And then um, I just wanted to paint a black and white portrait and I loved this image and it just for some reason reminded me of, of uh, one of those ritual, I think it's, it's that kind of flat two-dimensional profile view and then that strong, um, a lot of the strong like curvilinear shapes of that kind of fabric blowing in the wind and then all of these naturalistic patterns in, in the embroidery and stuff made me think Minoan, Minoan, Minoan. So um, that said, I'm going to do a little bit of a paint along tonight and um, I was going to do this in uh, Art Rage, which I've been working in extensively recently, but for now I'm just going to play in Photoshop just because that's kind of what I, I have open right now. and. Um, and I think what I want to do is get on the right layer, hopefully. There we go. Um, is talk to you a little bit about, a little bit more about the Minoans as, as I begin to do some work here. Um, one of the things that I absolutely uh, love about the Minoans and is, is that they, they were perched. And let me see if I can sketch this. Um, if I can turn this layer off, and this layer off, I'm going to do a really crude sketch. So if we have Southern Europe, where Southeastern Europe, you've got like, say this is like Greece, forgive the horrible um, drawing of Greece, and you kind of work your way over here to like Turkey, and then you have um, North Africa here in Egypt, and, and you've got like Kenan, like there were the Hittites here. Um, you've got early Greeks, Mycenaeans here. You've got Crete floating right here in the middle. The Zycladic Islands here. And then you've got Egypt down here. So there's like this triangle of incredibly warlike civilization, strong, so strong military, you know, very um, powerful cultures that, you know, you hear about. Um, all, all, all the time, you know, you hear all about these cultures and you know about them to, to some degree, but um, here right in the middle is is the Minoans and um, a fascinating piece of the puzzle when studying them is that they the archaeological evidence shows that there's an incredibly minimal um, amount of of accessories that you would find for warfare. I mean, minimal to no weaponry found on on the island itself. Um, 
there are fresco depictions of of you know ex maybe some extensive uh, ships, and so maybe they had a powerful navy. Um, but the 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 question is is you know here are these like these powerful or like civilizations that are just wrapping all the way around them, and then here in the middle seems to be this this culture that has small to minimal military uh, there's not a lot of archaeological evidence to support a lot of weaponry or anything like that on on the land um, you know there's just just not a lot there um, there's ample evidence of very powerful female um, representation in all of the most important um, cultural activities you know you've got um, seems to be some sort of strong specialization between the sexes where you have um, both like not only just different color clothing or a different type of clothing but um, different pigmentation in the skin between the male and female um, and the female always in this kind of like very powerful roles um, depicted as like pr as priestesses or or as like um, administrative figures or as goddesses or deities like so there's there's some component that just um, of this society that just lends itself to being one of the strongest candidates for there being an actual ma matriarchal society and in in, in in one of a very unique very uniquely so in western society and um and so then like another interesting thing is like you know well, where do they come from this this potentially matriarchal um strongly egalitarian society um they just where, where do they come from who are their ancestors where you know where do they how where do they arrive there from and it, it seems like their genetic makeup um just looking at the evidence there is is tied to europe um that they have a lot of genetic similarity to, of course, the, the contemporary uh, inhabitants of Greece, but also to historic uh, Europeans at the time, and then and then um, and then later to to the Greeks as well. That that um, ended up intermingling, and we'll talk about that too. Um, one one of the figures that's just super compelling to me in, in just my kind of artistic imagination was that figure, that snake priestess figurine, um, wondering, you know, what is the inspiration there? What is going on? And then you learn a little bit more about um, the geography and the geology of, uh, of the area, and you see that Thera, which is modern-day Santorini, um, is a was was if you look at, at at that island right now you you'll see that it is a c-shaped landmass where um in the in the time of the minoans at their peak it was not it was um a, a more more traditionally shaped island um this area was was known historically and, and even in the minoan era to be uh, very volatile um, volcano earthquake um, and and there's even some um, example of of their buildings being somewhat earthquake proof you know not not to the degree that you would find in like Japan today or something like that but but um, by ancient standards there is some some recognition of there being some attention to that and some development of technology for that um, so you've got this ancient civilization that's doing um, dealing with the the natural phenomena that are, are making life that is making life pretty complicated for them. You have um, you have Thera uh, Santorini, which is you this very active volcano historically, and then even in their time, um, and then you have this seem to be some sort of uh, religious practice or ritual practice of these snake priestesses or snake goddesses and you think you know well maybe okay so this is me like a lot of conjecture here but maybe um the and this isn't like my idea or anything there's plenty of people who have been writing about this for a long time but um maybe 
these ritual practices involving snakes um, has to do with the um, sensitivity, like like sort of a, a, a cult or whatever, around um, trying to be tuned in to what nature is doing, right? Like um, uh, some sort of like if if they you know if there's like a natural disaster about to occur, you can always tell like based on how your your pet is acting, right? And so maybe you know uh, snakes being lower to the ground, more sensitive to tremors and and um, tectonic activity, maybe acting as as a sort of canary in the coal mine, sort of like an early responder to um, to any of this activity. And and maybe therefore you could imagine some religious practice evolving around that and um, around being tuned into that. And then you have these, maybe these priestesses or these um, um, people who preside over over like these snakes and, and kind of act as the, um, I don't know, as the, the shamans of the society to sort of like help uh, guide people through what may or may not be coming. Um, and I know you know that's the we don't have any translations and we are, we can only make guesses, but there's some some makes some sense, right? Um, so that that something like that could happen. So here we have this matriarchal e e egalitarian society where um, there's these people who are painting this like flourishing of nature and human beings in this joyful abundance, and this this curvilinear kind of like playfully. Uh, uh, beautiful expression of of life itself in its many forms right like not just the fauna and the human in the humans but like also the flora the beautiful stylization and curving uh, curvilinear expression of the plants and um, the waves and and the dolphins and the octopus and on and on I mean you can look at slide after slide image after image um, and it is really captivating because um, it, I can't help but just be deeply, um, my, my mind just gets sort of deeply wrapped up in like, how did this happen? Who were these people? Where, where did they, um, how did they exist between all of these, these very powerful warlike societies with, with what seems like no active military? How did they um, keep the, the enemies at bay the, or the potential threats at bay? How did they... Um, you know, there's a lot of theories. I had a, a professor in university who said he, he figured that, um, you know, we're, here we are in Colorado. And so, you know, there's like the Pearl Street Mall in Boulder, Colorado. It's like this nice walking mall. And he said, you know, uh, his belief was that the Minoan Crete was um, basically like the walking mall, the shopping mall with all the fancy stores and uh, anthropology and uh, whatever else. Right. Um the store, not the not the not the, the science, right? But like um, the fancy stores, it, that it was like the the walking mall of the ancient world. In that, you know, no one wanted to destroy it because it was kind of like the the vacation spot, the where to go to get all the best stuff. And clearly, in in the um, administrative centers, the palatial um, sites that we looked at in the first slide that I showed you that the ruins were that Sir Arthur Evans was somewhat reconstructed. Um, they were places where craftsmanship of goods, goods and, and tabulation of goods and services. So not only the production of goods, but the, um, tabulation of trade and, and that kind of thing was certainly an activity that was happening there. Um, along with what must have been some ritual practices and communal practices and, you know, and, and, a, and a host of other things. But they were, you know, very much multi-use um, spaces. And I think uh, just while that, you know, while that one, um, my professor, that, that man was a genius. Um, so, I, you know, I, everything he said, I, I took kind of like, I really took seriously. Uh, that, that makes some sense to me. Um, there could be many other explanations that were are very valid and very um you know very worth meditating on so who knows right but um but i do think that the, the fact that it just that it exists at all that we have this um this documentation of a society that just was was different than 
um, than our society, than than many of the societies in the West. This this society that um, that seemed to paint uh, nature in such a way that um, that it, everything about it felt full of celebration and life, and that there were these. Um, not just not just uh, these snake priestesses kind of like um, goddess practices, but there were also um, really interesting. Uh, you saw the bull jumper fresco, and that's an incredibly famous fresco that shows, um, you know, not not like uh, Spanish bullfighting, but literally jumping over the creature, right? This big, powerful uh, bull and and there's a lot of debate about whether that was you know like um, a myth being represented visually on the wall or if there were, if there was evidence archaeological evidence of the people actually jumping these bulls and so um, you know if you have an interest in ancient civilizations and you want to go explore some of this stuff what a fun um, what a fun thing it would be to go dig into this stuff um, on your own and see if you can piece together some of the mystery that, that still remains about the Minoans and of which there are many. Um, so there also are these beautiful, and I should have put it in the presentation, um, bulls head uh, ritons is what they're called, and they were like ritual vessels that you would put um, you know, expensive or important liquids in, and then after use, they were often just like intentionally smashed. And the the fact that that's the case is like astonishing because um, a lot of these things are s sculpted out of beautiful hard stones, and then inlaid with like crystal and and glass and all kinds of um, the unbelievable craftsmanship. Um, and then inla inlaid with gold and and wrapped in gold leaf and painted and then you know and then etched into and these things are like the most beautiful um again that natural uh, that 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 stylized realism where there's this high level of naturalistic um observational realism going on but at the same time there's this um this just kind of synergy with their own um stylistic interpretation and and kind of there's a, a harmony between all of the different um, pieces that you'll find you know they, it couldn't have been that there was just one artist making all this stuff but of the many artists that were were doing pottery and the frescoes and the sculptures and there's there's an, just an abundance of this stuff and it and all of it has sort of a similar visual language and all of it has a strong 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 um, visual impact and and speaks to a way of seeing the world a way of seeing human beings a way of seeing human beings in nature in harmony a way of of almost like this everything is like this celebratory um uh, imagery of it just it is like a, a celebrating life kind of imagery so um all of that, you know, it just begins to scratch the surface of why I am so interested in the Minoans and why um, even without all of those in incredible anomalies and mysteries and and beautiful, strong representations of, of women in 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 either equal or or uniquely powerful positions uh, to men, um, even without all of that. Right. Even without all that, just the artwork alone is incredibly cool and um, very, uh, very memorable. Like, um, it's hard to for me to think of any other ancient artwork that stands out as strongly to me. Um, I, I mean, we've seen the Sphinx and the amazing pyramids, and we've seen um, we've seen Greek sculpture and Roman copies of Greek sculpture, and we've seen um, a massive Egyptian um, monuments and and tombs and and excavations of tombs, but to me the Minoan artwork stands alone in its. Um, there's just something very inspiring about it, and something very lifelike about it, and something very celebratory about it. So um, let's talk about what happened. You know, like where well, where did they go? Right, why? 
why are we not talking about them so much when we talk about the ancient Greeks? Why are we not talking about them so much when we're talking about um, later, you know, as, as history moves forward? Well, something very, again, mysterious happened, um, which many people think, and, and it makes a lot of sense that they think this, many people think had to do with an incredibly destructive and powerful volcanic eruption on Thera, which is, you know, modern day Santorini. And that eruption um, is the most destructive, most powerful eruption in recorded history. And um, evidence of its uh, sort of ejection of material into the atmosphere um, can be uh, seen far, far away. Um, was recorded by civilizations that lived far, far away as it in, in impacted global climate and, um, and, and crop yields f far away from its origin. Um, again, think about this, the, the most destructive, most powerful volcano in recorded history. Okay. And then, and Thera Santorini is just to the northeast of Crete. And to think about this society that um, that seemed to have so much of its ritual practice based on these these snake priestesses or this kind of being tuned into nature. If you look at their artwork and that kind of familiarity and and connectedness and um, camaraderie with the natural world, and then all of a sudden this incredibly destructive force that just interrupts not just you know, think of the tsunami and think of the, um, so all the coastal dis disruption and destruction, but then think of the climate di disruption and destruction and the way that impacts food crops and the way that impacts trade. And so you not only are dealing with like the immediate, right? Like, oh, we've got disruption, disruption of food supply. We have disruption of like, we've got major settlements that have been wiped out because anything on the coast is now gone. Um, but now we also have um, like trade shut down and now how are we going to not only feed ourselves but trade to, to keep any semblance of, of the life that we had right and then on and on so it's it's not like you know it's a lot like this um, pandemic we're in right now where we're like kind of guessing well how long is this going to last well what do we do like we can't stay in lockdown forever but you know and then you you, you if you were to come out and then it just if it just kept like surging you know and you could never kind of get past it is that sometimes the, the effects of things, um, natural disasters can be really long winded. And, um, and that was the case here. And I think what, what we see in the archeological record is that although it was incredibly disruptive and although there was a, a ton of destruction and although, um, you know, everything was disrupted, it was not the final blow. Um, the society persisted and, um, they didn't get back to thriving, but things were reconstructed and, and artwork was made, but then things changed. You know, the artwork looked a little different. There was a little bit more anxiety and tension in the work than there used to be. There was a, you can see stylistically the evolution of the psychology and the people that, that something shifted. And, um, and it seems like, um, the end of it all came later, um, after maybe more tremors and, and aftershocks and earthquakes and, and other, other instabilities. Um, but it was, it wasn't the natural disasters that ultimately did them in. It seems as though the Minoans uh, ultimately succumbed to what looked like internal strife. And in my guess, the internal strife is just, you know, at some point the people can no longer, maybe they no longer have confidence in an administrative leadership that can't protect them from, um, ongoing problems right or maybe there was just maybe there was you know corruption or maybe there was um uh the stratification of society and the re maybe some you know renorming of of life following all this disaster maybe there was a uh, wealth distribution was was not fair and and people were struggling or you know who knows right but all we know is that there were uh, major disruptions to the quality of life the the normal uh, operation of life, there was an incredible, um, un unprecedented disaster in the area that had long-lasting effects. 
and while the civilization continued to persist, things eventually fell apart. And um, and it looks like that the all, all, many of the sites were were burned, as though there were you know almost just like an uprising, and and things were burned from within. And then um, what we have following that is the Mycenaeans, which are the you know kind of like early Greeks on the mainland there, um, who take over, almost like um, whether it was a hostile takeover or an internal uprising, it seems like operations continued but were then run by um, outside entities. And that was really the end of the Minoans as um, we would as we would ever know it. Um, and, and, and following that, um, at best, they were uh, sort of a satellite of, of mainland Greece. And that's, again, all we know. Um, we just know little bits here and there. Um, toward the end, the, the language um, was no longer the linear A undeciphered language, but something called linear B, which was more of an administrative language that was um, is more uh, synonymous with what you would find in the Greek mainland and so therefore we have kind of a, we have been able to decipher that language um, and so you know in that and many other reasons are why we can tell that um, that the Greeks were uh, or the Mycenaeans were in charge uh, at that point um, but mysteries persist and we we don't know the language we don't understand uh, what was happening with the rituals, with these snake priestesses, with these um, amazing uh, harvest festivals, these these buoyant uh, male figures going out to to the land, and 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 you know um, whether they were sowing seed or 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 claiming the harvest. I mean, who knows? But um, we have um, unprecedentedly beautiful artwork wild advancements in technology could you imagine that you know um, over 4,000 years ago you could be using indoor plumbing when um, you know I live in a house that was built in 1922 and, and there's evidence that some of our neighbors did not have indoor plumbing when their homes were constructed and um, ours was was crude at best their massive remodels were needed just to make the house kind of uh, up to modern standards but if you were to look inside these um, palatial structures in, in Crete, you would see um, beautiful, uh, unbelievably beautiful ornamentation and art, artwork and um, flexible living spaces with changeable rooms and room sizes. And, um, you know, of course, they don't have electricity back then, but the innovations for, for solving how to get light and fresh air into these big, deep, uh, multi-layered palatial complexes was was really uh, innovative the light wells that they were used in the staircases and the grand staircase and all these different things that you can look up and just uh, satiate all your curiosity and see what what it's all about well you know there's there's a lot there um, and it's for me kind of a uh, it's close to my heart um, you know I think when we uh, all of us, you know, look at society daily, especially in, in a moment like this where we're examining, well, what is this thing that, you know, is how are our first responders being treated or how do we manage in a, a pandemic or what what does what is what does public education mean um, if we don't all have equal access and how do we get equal access for every student to make sure everybody has Internet at home so they can all be watching this video and dialoguing with each other and sharing ideas and being exposed to cool ideas from the past. And when you start to think about all that stuff, you start to think about what society is and you start to think about the inequalities that are obviously there and whether it's um, it's racial or it's, it's um, based on, on gender or it's on, uh, you know, um, socioeconomic stuff like, and you, and you look back at a society like the Minoans and you think, wow, um, they, it, by a lot of the evidence, there there's strong reason to argue that they had an egalitarian society um, with strong roles for for females, so that they had um, 
you know, accessible wealth for, you know, a fair number of their citizens that they had. Um, yeah, just it just makes you think that I wonder what their life was like. I wonder what um, made things what 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 things were were really all about like if what would it have mattered if you were born as a, a male or a female back then what would it have mattered if you were um from were there different um ethnic groups or, or were were all people kind of treated sort of somewhat equally um are, are the bold jumping frescoes depictions of real life kind of athleticism or or are they kind of a fant fantastical um, portrayals of of local mythology um you know it, it just it, it's just really really good stuff to think about because it gives you um that kind of line of questioning gives you a, a heck of a lot to play with uh, in your imaginative artistic mind so um that's why i wanted to look into this um, minoan society and i wanted to to take a cue from it um I think there's so much more to talk about, um, but I feel like that might be a pretty decent introductory survey of it. Um, I wonder, let's see if I had any, any more to think about. Oh yeah, yeah, I think, I think one more thing I wanna talk about is, um, so they're called the Minoans because um, Sir Arthur Evans um, basically just like, this pretty wealthy guy from England um, back in the turn of the century um, took inspiration from Heinrich Schliemann who like I said found um, there to be actual archaeological evidence of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and he found Troy and he you know found all this stuff and well uh, Evans was like oh my gosh that's so cool and uh, took inspiration from that and um, went out and, and and found that the story of the Minotaur and um, all of this was was also maybe representative of a real place. And what's interesting about the the, the story of the Minotaur and um, is there's a really strong presence of bull horns and bull imagery and bulls heads like come all over the island. And so there, there is this kind of ritual, historic, religious connection uh, between the bull and and maybe this this ancient Greek myth, right? Um, so so perhaps there is some inspiration there too. Like maybe the Mycenaeans are remembering uh, the Minoans through that story. And another interesting thing is the labyrinth. So um, there is the palatial structure at, on Knossos and, and in Crete is is incredibly labyrinthine and so for all of you uh, of my students and we know how the, the school halls are where we um, attend our learning um, it's often called labyrinth like a labyrinth right well imagine that times times 10 or times 100 and you have this deep complex palatial structure uh, on Crete and you could see um, maybe how walking through this un, uh, this movable, changeable um, space that it was, how a foreigner might deem it uh, kind of labyrinthine and how that word is associated with um, what you find on the island. Um, so there's like these labyrinthine palatial structures, which you guys are not fortified military encampments. They're not walled cities. They're not anything like that. So um, again, kind of pointing to at, at least this on land piece that was on the island. There are no real fortified cities, um, or at least nothing uh, substantially spread across the island. So um, if you could imagine um, this labyrinthine palatial structure, with all this bull kind of like imagery and worship or ritual something going on around it, um, what would you know I, I mean there has to be some sort of connection there between the story of King Minos and the Minotaur and the labyrinth and all of that um, one can can kind of um, doesn't take a lot of mental jumps to kind of find the overlaps and the connections there it's an interesting um, 
consideration also to to think about how um, these this strong representation of the female and of these kind of like earth uh, focused rituals um, and especially with the snake goddess snake priestess um, and then that transference to the Greek kind of sky god was Zeus kind of the the man in charge and all of his exploits that follow and so we kind of have like with the Minoans we have um, there's some narrative construction here uh, and maybe some people imposing some some of their kind of ideology on the archaeology but um, it would it's it's actually it's an interesting thing to think about is how maybe this um, more ancient society was kind of the earth god kind of earth deity kind of uh, female focused and that was replaced by this like male sky god when the, when the Mycenaeans took over and then you know become the Greeks and, and, and all that but just something to think about it's an interesting um, thought experiment to consider well um, what is the relationship between this society that, that predates the Greeks and had all this amazing um, technology and all this unbelievable artwork and had all of this uh, strong voice in in all of their creative activity and and how they um, how might they have impacted all of the societies around them and 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 what did their demise in their demise what did we lose you know what do, what did we lose track of in our our European past um, is there's just so much to be considerate of there and I I would love to um, see what you guys come up with as you explore the Minoans take some time to dig into um, Queens Megaron or just look at how the toilets were functioned or look at um, if you just did an, a survey of just the animal uh, frescoes to look at how like or or even I mean so just like the stylistic um, approaches and how they change through the different early late and and or early middle and late periods or you could look at the pottery and there's these different kind of movements within the stylistic approaches in the pottery and you could even look at pottery specifically that just ha is uh, with ornamentation of an octopus on it right and so you can look at and you can tell at what what period they were made um, based on the just the visual style and like um, you can see um, at that kind of like highest the period of highest flourishing you see like this very vibrant um, energetic kind of curious lifelike artwork and and it's fascinating to look at right and then after the after the volcano and the earthquakes and, and you see like a different sort of psychological um, approach to the work and the way that that it, it sort of visually represented so a lot of cool things to check out guys um, I'm very compelled to, to know what your thoughts are and um, if you think that um, you have some other theories on, on what happened to them or um, just you know maybe reflections on what you see as as inspirational or, or something just to, as a fun thing for your mind to just chew on a little bit as you um, as you work on a project and speaking of a project so let's take some inspiration from those Minoans and let's um, think of a project we could do um, that that would be um, inspired by them so for me I think the natural the like easiest go-to for this would be um, the connection with nature that's just such an, an easy one that's such a good go-to um, what would an artwork that uh, like a, how would a Minoan depict some of the natural environment around you you know like how would a, what would be the Minoan stylization of of drawing your dog right or drawing your cat or or um, you know, like instead of it being the saffron gatherers, they're picking the the stamens in the in the middle of these crocus flowers. What are what would be um, an equivalent act? You and your you and your brother, or you and your sister, uh, picking wildflowers on on in the foothills, or 
Um, I, I guess I'm just would say try to find some common voice with the Minoans who uh, were literally celebrating nature and the human activity within nature, who were literally celebrating nature as a living, um, like a living partner, um, and, and that there was certainly like a a deep connection with nature, and these were people that that didn't just draw from their memory, they, but they draw, they drew from observation. You could tell that there is a strong understanding of the way these things move and breathe and, and their behavior. And um, that although there is strong stylization, there is this realism in stylization that you can see in the Minoan artwork. And maybe that um, could be a focal point for you as well. So if you're going to take some inspiration there, um, you know, you can go any any direction you'd like. For me, I was just interested in the curvilinear shapes. And I'll, now I've just kind of established my overall, um, the kind of rhythm of this piece with the dark and the light shapes. Um, but, but looking at, at this sort of like depiction of wheat or laurel leaves or whatever it is on the, in these spiral motif on top of this floral element and that to me felt like it would be familiar to the Minoan artwork and so um, what I wanted to do tonight was just kind of my own inspiration and this uh, is is kind of where I went with it now just a little tip and trick for you digital artists out there I used a very textural brush and it leaves a lot of um, holes so you see the canvas behind and without having to go back and paint into a lot of that, I, I want to get like a darker value without having to do a lot of uh, painting into. So what I'm going to do is just on a layer behind, I'm just going to kind of mask in wherever I felt like there were some gaps. And that way I can kind of control a little bit the, the value development. Um, I can push lights and darks without having to go in and actually do much repainting I can kind of leave that raw brush stroke um, without having to um, tidy it up too much which is definitely what I what I wanted so and then I can come in here and like darken a little bit the hairline or I can darken a little bit a little too much but I can darken a little bit the, the lips and still a little bit too much having a hard time with that one but that's the idea um there we go just needed a little smaller brush sometimes that's okay um i hope you enjoyed tonight and talking about the minoans i hope you um enjoyed being able to uh, go to a different part of the world and hopefully learn something about uh, civilization that that maybe you're not as familiar with but um, I really am grateful for you guys uh, working so hard and learning new things hopefully you take some inspiration from this beautiful ancient culture and uh, the mysteries that they still hold um, and maybe you can uh, explore some of those mysteries with your artwork um, share it out with me however you can um, whether it's in Google Classroom or, or wherever else but uh, best wishes to you guys and stay safe out there. Hopefully you're at home doing something creative during this pandemic, um, whether it's building a puzzle or cooking a pie or in my case, and, and I hope you're doing this too, doing a lot of painting. So uh, stay safe and keep swinging your brush, guys. Take care.